you going to start recording when i start speaking start start recording sir yeah okay Uh, I can see Sanjay. Okay, let's start. I think Sanjay, I can see he'll probably be joining soon. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining uh, for this online session. I'm so excited to be here for next hour and a half and look forward to all the comments because I fundamentally believe this is such an exciting space. This is a space which is so underrated as yet in India. Hopefully after Swati's efforts, it will not remain so after some time. The good news is that I'm going to just provide opening remarks. Swati is going to take over and you'll have an exciting session. But let me uh, you know, reflect a little bit on why we are discussing CBC. We fundamentally believe at CII that innovation is something which is of course given. Innovation is something which all corporates have no choice. There are various ways of driving innovation. One of the key ways in which, or one of the key methods or pathways for innovation, we believe at CII will happen is through CVC. Last year in 2021, nearly one fourth of the corporate VC deals were done by CVC, corporate VC deals across the world. I think in India, the number is probably a much, much smaller percentage, but hopefully, as you plod along, uh, it will uh, certainly increase. I think it's a win-win situation in India, the CVC model. Uh, corporates want innovation. They want to put their bets in multiple baskets. Uh, startups, uh, by definition, have innovation. Some of them succeed, some of them fail. Uh, startups can benefit from the enormous amount of mentorship they can get from corporates. Uh, if the startup succeeds, uh, corporates can double down on investments. Whichever way you look at it, it's a win-win situation. This is just the beginning. The best is yet to come. And it's over to Swati uh, to moderate the session. I will be, be there in the session, but this session is Swati's to moderate and handle. I'm looking forward to all the comments by the speakers and by Swati. Over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Ninad, for uh, the opening remarks. And I think at CI, we've really been trying over the last couple of years to, uh, you know, sort of start this dialogue and conversation around corporate venture capital uh, for our members and also for uh, a lot of our startup members and startups who are interested in uh, engaging with uh, traditional and conventional um, industries. So I think CI has been working quite hard at, you know, acting as a platform for these sorts of um, interactions. So to start today's session, uh, I'd like to just do a quick uh, introduction of our panelists. They all have, uh, you know, have had uh, uh, great careers and a lot of achievements. So I won't go into great details. Uh, the, the resumes will be shared uh, in the chat box by the CII team, but I'll just do a brief uh, introduction. So firstly, we have um, Rajesh Narsimhan. He is the CEO of TBS Digital. Uh, Rajesh is an alumnus of IIM Ahmedabad and also holds uh, a master's in computer applications and a bachelor's degree in statistics. And he currently serves as the director and chief uh, executive officer of TVS Digital, which is headquartered in Singapore. And this is being used to, uh, you know, operationalize a digital technology startup um, focused strategy. Uh, in the automotive and fintech industries with the portfolios and offerings that will deliver high quality solutions and platforms to help address real life business challenges by harnessing the power of uh, a lot of cutting edge technology, including analytics, artificial intelligence, augmented reality, uh, IOT, machine learning and uh, virtual reality. Uh, Rajesh currently holds directorships on several boards, Sundaram Clayton Limited and TVS Motors Singapore, to name a few, and also several board positions at the startups that they have invested in, including uh, Altizen Systems, Fabric IoT, Intellica Telematics, and a whole host of others. Um, our next panelist is uh, Dabodita Das. She is the head of Tata Steel InnoVenture. She began her career uh, in as well, mining for 15 years, 
with uh, experience in areas like raw materials, sourcing and characterization, process technology, uh, product management, uh, and addressing several sustainability challenges uh, along the way. Uh, so currently in her role as head of InnoVenture, she drives the startup engagement at Tata Steel across the, the value chain. And uh, she takes great pride in conducting multiple pilots and strategic collaborations with uh, startups across the different thrust areas for Tata Steel. Um, and she has also led the first JV with a startup in the medical material space. Uh, our third panelist is Sanjay Bakshi. He is the program director uh, at Shell E4 Startup Hub, and he's led diverse strategy and innovation projects in the last uh, 16 plus years uh, uh, at Shell. And he's worked extensively in a leadership role, crafting digital strategy and low carbon emission projects. And he's also led several critical venture capital deals to support startups uh, to raise funds. And in uh, his experience at Shell, he has also led critical JVs, acquisitions, and divestment proje uh, projects, and co-created many digital products uh, for Shell India as well as for um, global markets. And of course, he has a deep expertise in, in shaping up early stage companies uh, through the uh, Accelerator project as well. So first of all, I'd like to thank all the panelists you know, for taking the time to be a part of this session today. And I would request uh, each of you to, you know, share with the audience uh, just a brief introduction of the uh, corporate venture capital uh, activities, you know, in your company, uh, the philosophy of what you do, and maybe a little bit also about, uh, you know, the process of how you you go about it. Uh, so perhaps Rajesh, we could start with you uh, and TVS Digital. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Now, also, uh, you know, the invitation. So, look, uh, when we look at CBC in the Indian context, you know, it's still nascent in India, as most organizations are either not familiar with the concept and or are risk averse. But there are a few forward thinking groups that have embarked on the journey, and I personally believe that some success stories here will help create a level of confidence and comfort for others to follow suit and growth in the CBC will then occur automatically and potentially at an exponential pace. Coming to what uh, the origins of CVC are and our company and group, the idea of CVC and our group emanated from our chairman emeritus, Mr. Vedas Srinivasan, and the managing director, Sudesh Chandran, over five years ago, when they wanted to explore this emerging concept as part of the inorganic evolution of the system. The thought process then was to evaluate and invest in a portfolio of strategically relevant digital startups globally that could help our group companies with their digital transformation initiatives and support the organic aspect of TVS Digital while delivering appropriate financial returns. So, you know, for TVS Digital, we're building our own platforms for FinTech and Autotech, as what we call that in production. Now, as a group, we continually evaluate global startup ecosystems and engage with a host of startups in FinTech, digital manufacturing, and Autotech, as well as people of mobility. So, you know, we look at these companies, look at what uh, startups could bring potential value add to our business and consumers, and uh, we don't restrict the ecosystem of uh, companies that work with us to be within the portfolio. I mean, we have a lot of startups working with us and we are not invested in all of them. Uh, so that's where I would say from a TVS uh, you know, perspective uh, about what, where we are and what we do today. But all of our investments to date are strategic investments where the startups typically expect a lot of appropriate engagement and support in terms of business, both through our references and group companies they expect mentorship, guidance in areas of compliance, governance, go to market, product innovation. So we help them create and operationalize value creation plans where it takes them from the journey of where they are today to where they wish to be in the next five, seven years with entry milestones so that they can course correct during uh, the course of the journey. So things are very well defined. It's got a lot of structure attached to it and the detailed action plans that go around the four pillars of product, finance, and operation client partners and organization for any organization that becomes the four pillars and that's what we do in the value chain. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rajesh, and look forward to sort of digging more into that, uh, you know, over the course of the session. Maybe Namanita, if you would like to just share with uh, the audience a little bit about, you know, uh, the the origins of uh, Tata Steel in a venture and, you know, your sort of uh, yes. journey with startups. First of all, Swati, thank you so much for inviting me to this exciting session. 
um let me go back to in 2019 tata steel as a concept as a journey in startup engagement it started in 2019 when there is a small group has been created called innoventure the key objective of this group is to work with startup across the value chain but at that point of time we were not sure about the uh, engagement model or we were not sure about the cvc uh, so to say so uh, we as a group it has been created in 2019 and since then we have been working in multiple thrust areas and all these thrust areas are aligned to tata steel strategic areas whether it is decarbonization or it is low grade raw material utilization or it is um, new age functional coating or maybe digitalization but all these areas are related to strategic area we scouted startups globally local and global startup we contacted them we we had thorough techno commercial discussion and after having a uh, rigorous um, engagement with the startup for last two years we are now standing uh, in a position where we have more than 1000 startups in our portfolio and we are doing an, uh, around 35 to 40 pocs and pilot at different level at different uh, views with status team now while we are engaging with the startups uh, through this pocs and pilot the one quest constant question came into our mind that what will happen after the poc especially in the area which are of strategic interest to us so uh, with the help of leadership um, support and guidance last year we thought that cvc is the uh, most logical route or step after conducting a successful poc of, of, with a startup which are aligned to our uh, um, goal or are aligned to our strategic area so the poc uh, cvc concepts although it is not new in tata group but it is new to tata steel we don't have a cvc yet but we have been given this um, uh, this this responsibility to, to evaluate individual case with the lens of cvc and we have been doing so for the first past one year and that is why we have been successfully done a jv with a uh, advanced material related startup and we are looking forward to do many such uh, jv and investment in near future as well and i think we'll when we discuss in the, all these aspects in data detail in the later part of the presentation i'll also talk about the steps and intermediate things that we do while we are engaged with the startups Great, thank you. And of course, you know, as as we all know, the the steel industry is you know quite a quite a traditional and legacy industry. You know, so it's it's great to see uh, the initiatives that are being taken by um, Tata Steel. Um, our third panelist, uh, Sanjay Bakshi, if you Sanjay, if you could just go ahead, uh, you know, and share with us a little bit about uh, you know the obviously Shell has not just in India but internationally a, a very long journey of engagement. Uh, with startups, so if you could share a little bit about that, uh, you know, and what you do at uh, E4 as well. Sure, thank you, and uh, sorry for the technical glitches I had initially to to come onto this call. Um, um, so uh, yeah, so I'll I'll, I'll go back uh, uh, four years back when we started E4, and uh, the whole idea of uh, E4 was that how we can really look into disruptive innovations, which is uh, existing in the ecosystem and and how we integrate that with our businesses uh, in shell and 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 that's the time when we created uh, e4 an incubation arm now parallelly we also have our shell ventures arm globally now shell ventures arm again looks into all these startups who can kind of create value to shell and at the same time shell also wants to see that uh, you know the money we invest in these companies grow right now it it works very very well the way we work within Shell E4 and the Shell Ventures because Shell Ventures keeps a very close eye on the various uh, technology and this, and the startups we bring on on board, yeah, and and how we help them to become market ready, scale ready. Um, in E4 also we we invest in these companies of course uh, through an equity model, uh, and then and and we bring in mostly startups at a very early stage. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, you know some of the startups are at a you know. Uh, you know, where the product is at the lab and we help them to take the prototype, you know, at the commercial level. And and and, and during this journey, uh, Shell Ventures keep a very close eye and to see that how much they are creating value for the Shell businesses through the POCs, through the deployments they do. And, and at the strategic, you know, time, uh, there are some selected startups we have invested further by the Shell Ventures. So, uh, so, so Shell Ventures and, and um, you know, E4 works very closely on that space. Yeah. 
Great. Thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Sanjay, for sharing that. Um, you know, just to share the, the context, you know, in uh, with a little broader perspective for today's discussion, I wanted to start with a question, you know, to each of you, um, you know, how do you view the uh, corporate venture capital ecosystem in India? You know, as we all know, um, India has the world's third largest uh, startup ecosystem. Uh, but CVC is still in a nascent stage, uh, you know, as Dinad mentioned as well in his opening uh, remarks compared to the rest of the world. Globally, I think CVC accounts for almost 25% of VC funding, but in, in India, we're, you know, quite far behind. So I'd love to hear your thoughts, you know, um, uh, obviously, you know, outside your company, why you think there's been this sort of hesitation on the side of large corporates uh, to engage with startups and and with CVC. So I'd, I'd love to hear uh, each of your thoughts. Yeah, I could go first. Uh, Swati, sure, go you... ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So uh, no, uh, you're right. And uh, again, when Rajesh also mentioned, mentioned it is a very nascent stage. Um, um, and, and, you know, my few takes on this is, uh, Enterprises are primarily focusing on what they know the best. Yeah, if they're in a product company, they, they, they manufacture the product and, and they know how to sell and they wanted to focus on that to create value in, in what they do. Uh, and, and they always uh, look forward, you know, first of all, they were very hesitant initially to look for uh, any disruptive technology and they wanted to integrate with the business. And, and at least we have that open mindedness where they're very open to kind of look into early stage companies. Uh, earlier, it used to be they would go to their contract and procurement team and say, look for a vendor. I think that's the kind of approach and, and it's shifting towards, let's look around the early stage companies and the startups and see what value they can bring on. Now, while they do it, now they realize that uh, it's also worth investing in these companies. Yeah, and, and it's I wouldn't say that they are very confident today. It's very shaky, but they are thinking of those investments. Now, there are different ways they are investing. Some of the CVCs are working, creating an SPV with a venture capital arm because they wanted to share their risk not alone, but with somebody with another venture capital arm who understands, you know, the various aspects of investing in an organization. Some of the organizations are thinking that uh, if I really like the solution and I, re I really want to make it exclusive, why don't, why don't I acquire the company or go with the mergers with that organization? So various ways these investments are happening, but it's opening up. Uh, but I would still say that uh, it's far away from where we wanted to see these companies come with an open arms and, and invest in these companies, you know, these startups. So. Yeah, that's my day. Thanks. Thanks, Sanjay. And I think it's it's true. A lot of us just, you know, want to stick to what's uh, familiar. And that was, you know, sort of the purpose of today's call is really to, you know, kind of um, uh, share with a lot of our members, you know, different models for uh, engaging with startups. So Rajesh, Rabunita, you know, I'd love to hear, uh, you know, your thoughts as well. You know, Swati, I mentioned earlier, like, this, this is absolute familiarity and comfort. So with a lot of forward thinking groups have already started doing this success will build success and that will uh, automatically lead to some exponential growth. But the other thing is, you know, comfort zone, it takes a lot to get people out of the comfort zone. And as uh, Keith mentioned earlier, the issue and challenge that uh, comes up is that it takes a while, particularly India is huge with manufacturing and uh, organizations and so on. And here the cultural transformation digital takes a lot of time. Also, the discomfort is, hey, uh, do we need to work with these startups? Will they last? Will they survive? You know, you predicate your own transformation on this. Uh, and then you take a look at it. And a lot of people look at it as financial in, uh, investors. You look at family offices coming through. But if you want to be truly strategic, it takes a lot of effort. You got to run it like a program. It's not bits and pieces. You got to have a method to the madness. You have to look at uh, what is it that you own. It's not like a private equity or VC play where it's a spray and pray. You can't pick 10 and say, I'll succeed with one or two and the rest can fail. Because it takes a lot of time, money, and effort. And, you're, and if you're a listed company, then you're also accountable to shareholders and investors and analysts saying, hey, you know, what's happening with your investment portfolio? So you have to create value. You've got to work with the founders. And a lot of people don't have that either internally or they're not sure how to go about building that. In fact, we learned a lot in the last four or five years of the journey that we have it's been a tremendous learning, even as we built out our portfolio of companies, value creation plans, we're looking at a lot of value creation going on. It's a tremendous amount of learning both ways, with the founders, with our internal stakeholders, with the external stakeholders. And I think it's important to have the right people to manage it and also be receptive to humility and ground reality as you work through the process. Thanks. Thanks, Rajesh. Nabanita? 
I agree with both the points and what I have seen, especially all the projects are being run or any decision are being taken on the value of NPV and IRR. And most of the cases, when we are engaging with the startup, the fuzziness, the visibility is not there. So that's why people are hesitant and people also are aware that if we actually engage with that particular startup, we have to provide a lot of support, both financially, technically, mentorship. So that kind of bandwidth, whether it is existing in the uh, system, in spite of handling our day-to-day -day core job, that, that kind of hesitation, that kind of uh, fear is there, still there. And how will I go back to our board and say that I have invested in 10 startups and uh, only three or two are working? So how will I be judged at that point of time? That fear is still existing. That's why I think it is uh, still in the necessary stage. We have to accept the fact that Rajesh has told that we have to know the ground reality that only 15 or 20 percent will be there to give me return of what kind of return we are expecting. So otherwise, this rest 80, 85 percent, there will be a moderate or maybe less return or whatever we have envisaged that we have could not be able to get. So that kind of openness is still not there. We, with time, that will definitely be developed, but still not there. Thanks, thanks, Navanita. Uh, before I get to my next question, uh, just wanted to, sh you know, uh, inform the audience. Uh, some of you have sent in questions, uh, you know, at the time of registration. But for other participants, if you have any questions, you know, please put them in the the chat box or the the Q and A box, and I will be, uh, you know, sort of addressing them to uh, the panelists as we go along. Uh, if possible, please state also whether it's addressed to all the panelists or maybe just one or two panelists um, in particular. Um, you know, Rajesh, you touched upon, uh, you know, the, the sort of uh, team a little bit, and I'd love to hear, you know, from, from all of you uh, in terms of the composition of the, the team, because it's obviously a very different mindset, uh, you know, that you need to deal uh, with startups. So, so do your teams, uh, you know, are they a combination of sort of VC professionals and domain experts from the company? You know, does it sort of skew one way or the other? Is there, uh, you know, any other kind of... Um, uh, I guess any other professional inputs that you sort of look for uh, from the team that handles uh, the CVC part of your business. So I'd love to hear a little bit about that. So I'll go first on this. Uh, so for the, uh, we have both. So for our investment program that ran from April 2018 to December 2020, we needed external specialist advisors, including Bain Consulting in India and Deloitte in Singapore, to help us with the deal flow and commercial due diligence. So in commercial due diligence, being strategic investors, we all do a thorough analysis, 360, holistic approach, business, technology, product, and various aspects of the organization to do the diligence check. We then leverage PwC to help with financial due diligence jointly with our finance team, and Kaisan and Co, which is a leading legal firm, to help us with transaction documents and legal due diligence. Now, since all our investments are international, we also used in, in jurisdictions like the US, Singapore, etc. We also had local legal counsel supporting Kaisan because we needed to look at the local requirements, et cetera, very carefully. Because every transaction, every investment, we needed to protect and have a balanced um, uh, contract at the same time, protect the investments of BDS, right? So as an individual, individual contributor between the investment program phase, it is critical for me to institutionalize a strong program phase. This is why I keep coming back to that. Because I have to manage it effectively and efficiently. There are so many complexities, several moving parts, multiple partners, multiple stakeholders, and parallel transactions to close. So I typically leverage the support of our finance team internally and business teams at TVS Motors for digital manufacturing and fleet management and the business team at TVS Credit for credit underwriting during the commercial diligence and POC. I think uh, Navodita talked about POC. Now, POC is a very important and mandatory if you're doing a strategic investment. So before we committed to a deal, we validated the POC. So there were times that we would be discussing with three, four startups in the same area. We will allow them to do POCs and we pick the best the best chemistries, the best diligence results, and the best POCs. And the POCs were confirmed with our business team to reaffirm the solid value add and solidity of the startup while evaluating them holistically throughout the entire transaction engagement. So some transactions take even a year. And doing that, we build some equations with the founders, with other stakeholders internally and externally. Now, post closure of the investment program, we manage the investment portfolio internally. We have a finance and ops teams involved. We have the board uh, nominated board members, including myself. We have executive sponsors. This is an important thing for strategic uh, uh, 
uh, investors to consider. You know, from your own business, nominate senior management people to be executive sponsor for each of our invested portfolio companies. This way, they have somebody who can help them grow their business, gain visibility, help them navigate some of the bureaucracies that may exist within the organization, breaking the barriers, and help them grow and create value. Our focus is single-mindedly to deliver on the value creation plan commitment that we built jointly with the founders and the advisors to enhance the enterprise value. Now, what this BCP really does is it takes the uh, founders and startups from where they are today into a five to seven year journey, which is typically the time frame you look at strategic investors, financial investors the first few years or so. But then you basically help these gentlemen and ladies come through the entire journey across product portfolio of the company, the organization, clients and partners, financial and operational metrics, you build action plans and you have in between milestones so that you can track it, you can fine tune it, you can do course corrections, et cetera. We leave it domain experts to help some of these startups, particularly when they are working with us on building assets for, uh, for, for TDS that are specific to us and new products. And to help us unlock value, see one aspect is to create value, but the other is to unlock the value and monetize it. Here, we take help from our internal corporate m &AP, which has considerable and exclusive experience in this area. And of course, we reach out to external legal counsel uh, if there are any related transactions with this whole process. Great, thank you. Thank you, Rajesh. Uh, you know, I think that's a very comprehensive look at uh, the process and the team. And I'm sure, uh, you know, uh, a lot of our members uh, who are listening in will find that quite valuable as, as they start approaching CVC in their organizations um, as well. Uh, Sanjay and Abunita, I'd love to hear from you, you know, what, what the teams uh, look like and how you sort of built them out. Yeah, can I go next? Uh, Sanjay, is it okay? Uh, Please go. So, um... Uh, Swati, uh, we have uh, different stages in this entire engagement cycle. I can broadly segment into pre-POC stage, POC stage, post-POC stage, and portfolio stage. And in all these stages, although InnoVenture is the nodal team, however, different business people, different teams, different expertise are pulled in as and when required. For example, in the pre-POC and POC stage, it is completely technical team who are helping us, who are evaluating the technology. As I already mentioned, there is no dedicated CVC arm as of now in Tata Steel. However, we are evaluating the cases on, on, uh, on its period after the POC. So up to POC, it is the technical team who is uh, doing the technical evaluation and, uh, and uh, commercial evaluation and selecting a startup for a POC. Once the POC is successfully done, then with the business team of that particular BU, we evaluate the startup uh, across multiple year stage, whether it is the technical competencies, the team, and the multiple cross deployment opportunities, and the business or the top line or bottom line impact it is creating for Tata's team. And then we figure out which is the most suitable engagement model for the startup. If it is a normal vendor buyer model, then it is a fairly simple process. We hand it over to the procurement team and legal team, they take care. If it is not, say if there is a possibility of joint development uh, agreement of there, or there is a possibility of investment or JV, then another set of people we bring in. There comes in finance and account team, legal team, and there also it's a mix of both internal and exter external expert also. And we evaluate individual case, and then if it is found suitable, we, we, pro we take the proposal to Tata Steel board. Once we get an approval, and that has a fairly long process and lengthy process where we evaluate with our own financial team with the startup, and then we see how it is well suited. And once that decision is taken, and the startup is uh, is taken into our portfolio, there is another team from the business unit along with InnoVenture who will provide the support to the startup for scale up. The, the way we are doing with other JVs and all other engagement. So as uh, in, to summarize this, that at a different point of the journey, there are different people handled by InnoVenture, and as and when there the requirement is, comes up, we pull in the resources internally and as well as externally. Great, thanks, thanks, Navanita. Sanjay. Yeah, thanks. I think uh, so. So good to hear the, the kind of the team and which kind of supports. Uh, 
which Raj has mentioned and Nabudinda. For, for, for us, uh, just uh, the incubation, we are 10 plus team members. So it kind of, it kind of throws a light on uh, how much we focus uh, in building startups. Uh, and then at the back, we have each and every business unit focal point who works very closely with, uh, with us and the startups to see that uh, at a pre POC level. So, so we, we don't look at it at a POC level first. What we look into to first is at, at the theme level. And when we talk about themes and, and for example, if you're talking about future of mobility and, and in a battery storage or, or in the, into the EV space. Uh, and, and we know that the, the kind of work which Shell is working in India and globally. And then we know that where are the white spots and where we are really looking for certain technology or solutions. Yeah, can be in the battery chemistry, can be in the digital space as well. And once we do that, and that's the time where when we look for startups, you know, in that particular space. Yeah, and then, then we work very closely with the business to see that if we bring the startup, if we help them commercialize uh, their, their product, maybe their, their TRL might be at a, at a two or a three, but in you know, a post POC when their MVP is ready, can 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 we really create a value for Shell? You know, and then of course going forward, if the POC is successful, and that's the time where we think is can we really take it at a deployment level? And then that's the time when the CVC, you know, is interested to kind of have a close watch and see that whether we want to invest in this. And as uh, you know, others mentioned, we have entire ecosystem internally, uh, right from just give me one second right from uh, legal uh, to you know the uh, safety team because we 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 look into two aspects to it uh, swati one is commercial readiness for anyone but and which is everyone knows and understands but we also understand for shell enterprise readiness is equally important and when i say enterprise readiness uh, these young organizations they are very good you know in terms of the technology and what they want to build commercially but they may not be ready for working for a large organization like shell yeah, why I say that uh, in Shell, we have something called a GDPR or, or a data privacy requirement, yeah, which many of these org small organizations, you know, don't look into it because they're so focused in growing the business. But if one has to work for Shell, those compliances are extremely important. The ethics and compliances which organization is built on, yeah, the safety culture of the organization which they need to build on, right? So these are the things which we work in and then we, you know, we part these knowledges to them that how we, you can be enterprise ready for a Fortune 500 organizations or organizations, if you're working with a European company, every European company is going with the GDPR is, is a must for them because it's a, it's a legal mandate thing. But so, so those are the things we, we help them and there are the team internally who help, uh, you know, uh, these startups to, to, to be ready on those aspects as well, other than the commercial aspect. Thanks, Sanjay. And, you know, just building on your question, you know, I think it brings me to my next question, you know, for all the panelists and, uh, you know, you talked about uh, incubating startups in various stages of startups. Uh, you know, I was wondering, you know, how you look at, you know, each of you looks at uh, stages of startups, you know, whether it's early, late, a lot of uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk about uh, POC, pre-POC, later, you know, whether they're enterprise ready or not. So I'd, I'd love to hear, you know, a little bit more about um, the stages of startups that all of you uh, look at. And also if there are any metrics, uh, you know, of scale, revenue or, or otherwise um, that you might use uh, as filters before uh, engaging with startups. So maybe Sanjay, since you brought that up, we could start with you. Sure, sure. Why not? Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so. The one we look into is startup, which we call it a, a growth stage startup. You know, when we say growth stage startup, are the startups who are currently at an idea stage, uh, not any revenue, and their product is at the lab, and and they're yet to commercial, you know, prototype that product, you know, commercially, and and they would need a lot of help, not just in commercializing or being market ready, but also in their product development. And we help in those companies as well. So, you know, last week I was in IIT Madras there, and I was looking into one of the, you know, you know, uh, you know, you know, technology which is getting worked on, which is very interesting. And now, if we like those kind of technology, we bring those solutions up, and we help them to to build their product up, right? So that's that's the kind of a growth growth kind of a led uh, you know startups. Then what we bring in in we call it is a early stage startup, which is, which is primarily a seed stage, stage startup, which they have built a product, they have done POCs, but not have scaled up their, their businesses. Yeah. And, and they, they would probably bootstrapped or at a seed level investments. Yeah. And they wanted to scale, you know, their business, you know, and, and that's one of them. Then there is a category of startups who have at a series A level, they have a matured product, 
we have deployed and 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 have uh, you know certain revenue on board and they would further like to you know expand yeah and and those are the kind of startups we've been looking into so if i look into the mix of it uh, the series a level matured startups are 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 lesser for us uh, but the you know and if i say it could be 20% but the other 80% would comprise of the growth and the early stage startup now these are the areas where we work mostly uh, and and that's the way we define it uh, in, within shell thanks uh, maybe rajesh if you'd like to go next okay so uh, you know our focus for investments is being on early stage startups and uh, no specific preference is for partners including if it comes down to ideation people who don't have any revenue but they've got some interesting concepts they want to run that with our product and development team, we, we do partner with it. Uh, and typically, we look at the uh, early stage to late stage, depending on the funding history, the headcount, size of organization, years of existence, financial and operational metrics, client base, partner ecosystem, market presence, product maturity. So, the fundamental, the usual things that people normally look at. And I think Sanjay alludes to the fact that, you know, the space of investment, CDJ, 3 CDJ, CDJ plus, I mean, all that also helps to determine. Early stage is an early stage, also you have certain sub segments that come. But our focus has always been where there's been one or two rounds of funding, but the organization is still pretty nascent and young, and there's an opportunity to influence, coach, and engage appropriately and also build joint value together. Thanks. I think that's, you know, that's interesting. Both you and Sanjay have talked about working with fairly early stage uh, startups, you know, helping them unlock value. And then I guess also that helps with the alignment with uh, your own organizations as well. Uh, Navadita, I'd love to hear, you know, how uh, Tata Steel looks at stages of startups uh, in terms of engagement. Uh, Navanita, we can't uh, hear you. She's on mute, I think. Sorry, uh, there is some network issue at my end. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay. So as far as the stage of the startup is concerned, we are um, stage agnostic, so to say. However, it also depends on the thrust area at which we are looking for startup engagement. For example, if it is um, more strategic areas and uh, the, the challenge statement or the opportunity area a little bit long tends to work with uh, early stage or idea stage startup. However, if the challenge statement is such that we are, we are looking for an immediate solution, like for process efficiency or safety, these are the area we, where we would pro prefer to work with a little bit uh, later stage startup where we can quickly implement um, the startup in our, in our uh, plant location. And the offers that we provide to the startup are also different based on the uh, stage of the startup. For example, for, uh, for um, uh, uh, idea stage startup or early stage startup, we provide a different kind of support. Other than paid POCs, we support mentorship, we provide our lab access. Whereas for the uh, the, the uh, high tier level startup, we provide connect to the, our, our network, we provide our network to other Tata group companies. So we actually design the offering and the stage of the startup based on the thrust area in which we are working. Thanks, thanks for thanks for that. Uh, you know, all all three of the panelists we have today here, whether it's it's Shell, Tata Steel, or TVS, you know, they're all um, you know in in uh, all of you are in industries with uh, you know a few key players, few key competitors. Have you? I was just wondering if you've had a problem with startups, you know, willing to engage with you because they feel they might lose out. Uh, on a sort of customer base, uh, you know, with your competitors, or you know, if if they're sort of looking at, um, you know, engagement, mentorship, things like that, whether they feel that uh, sort of being, you know, for instance, being aligned with Tata Steel, does that affect your prospects with other steel companies similarly in automotive or uh, oil and gas as well? Uh, so I'd love to hear, you know, what your experience um, has been with startups, how willing they are to to engage uh, engage with you. So, uh, would you like me to go first, Shwati? Sure, sure, go ahead. Look, from personal experience, I feel they're quite reluctant. And it takes time and effort to get them comfortable, particularly if you're a strategic investor. 
I recollect uh, you know, 2018, 2020 time frame during the investment program, I spent a lot of time and effort from looking at founders and existing investors of our value addition and why they should even consider us to the capital. They were just to kind of make me feel I was going in for job interviews because I had to sell myself PDF and everything because this is not a forte for PDF. We had never embarked on this before. Primarily, startups are very concerned with strategic investors because they may impose excessive control, including around to your point, Shwadi, working with competition. Now, we accord a fair balance in this regard. We are not comfortable having our competitors on a cap table. When we invest, we want that blocked out. But doing business, you know, it, on a case-to-case -case basis, we, we, we request the founders to run this with us and with our businesses. But a lot of times, we just allow them to do business with the competition. Uh, and if there is a specific reason as to why we don't want them to do that, then we make good that business loss with our own internal businesses or referral businesses. So as a startup, they don't really uh, feel the, the pain of having to lose potential revenue on chain. That's, the, you know, you need to have a fair balance in the past. Thanks. Uh, Navanita or Sanjay? Yeah. Uh, yeah, Sanjay, go ahead. Uh, so yeah, uh, for us again, when it, when it comes to market access, um, uh, we we don't necessarily ring fence or stop uh, them to work with uh, uh, with others, of course, because the, because one of the reason is uh, you know Shell is kind of leading the energy transition, one of the leaders in the energy transition. We want uh, uh, this disruption and the technology to be available, you know, across, and and don't I don't want to limit it uh, for the scale of it, um, and, and 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 we encourage as well others to kind of imbibe into it. But when it comes to you know further to you know corporate venture investments, of course, uh, when when a lot of money goes in there, we definitely look into and and see that how how we can really uh, you know protect our our interest at the same time, um, and and of course uh, you know competition not only necessarily mean for us losing business, but it's all about for us is more important is is the data. Uh, and the technology, yeah, uh, which which we we have an IP because a lot of work which we do it internally are very confidential. So I think those aspects we definitely keep in that in mind. But um, when we were work and the incubation and help them to grow and 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 create give them POC or deployment, uh, we do not restrict themselves as such because our our single aim at that point of time is to see how the organization grows and create value not just for in Shell. But in the ecosystem, which is, you know, in the clean energy space is something we, we wanted to also, you know, see that uh, the, the community part is also been taken care of because uh, for us, what we're doing today in the clean energy space, it's not just business. Uh, we are because we wanted to, you know, seriously contribute and, and be part of the big change in of, of which is the climate change, which is happening. So, so because of the industry we are in, uh, we do not restrict uh, to that extent. Yeah, that, if that summarizes uh, Swati. Great, great. Thanks. Thanks, Sanjay. Uh, Nabanita? Uh, to my experience, I have seen that startups are fairly keen um, to work with status team, and uh, especially in the areas like decarbonization, coating, where there is a material place there, startups are keen. However, I would rather also like to highlight one or two points that um, there are few startups who are um, also willing to work with the corporates who are strategic investors. Since that point of time, uh, we don't have the visibility of CVC or we don't have the approval of in investing in st startup. So we lose some of the opportunities where the startups are keen that we will only work with those corporates who are strategically investing in us or in our technology or in our product. So for, uh, to summarize, uh, startups are keen. However, the value proposition or the support that startups are looking from the different corporate is different, different based on the thrust area, based on the level at that, or based on the geographic location they are working. Um, fairly, it is it is a uh, it is a very uh, good um, uh, experience and uh, knowledge sharing from both the side, and we have seen people are keen to working uh, working with the Tata team. Great. Uh, thanks. You know, my uh, before I get to my next question again, I'd just like to share with the audience in case you have any questions apart from you know those uh, that have been shared uh, at the time of registration. Please do uh, enter them into the chat box or the the Q and A box so I can um, you know uh, 
ask them to the, the panelists as we move on with the, the session. So actually, my next question was around, uh, you know, partnerships and, and it's a, a two part kind of a question. I think the, we'll get to the first part first, which is, you know, partnerships uh, with academic institutions. Now, a lot of academic institutions, uh, you know, in India have uh, incubators, accelerators, you know, and they do, uh, you know, work with a lot of startups. Uh, I was just wondering, you know, whether you have sort of, you know, used this as a route to to get access to startups. Are there any particular academic institutions? Because I think something which CI has been, you know, working on for a long time is, you know, a constant dialogue between academia and industry. You know, how do we make um, what's being taught, uh, you know, in academic institutions more relevant to industry? At the same time, how does, you know, industry kind of give give uh, productive feedback uh, to academia and, and maintain that sort of, you know, value chain. So I'd love to hear, uh, you know, about uh, your thoughts or if you have any kind of engagements or partnerships uh, with academic institutions. I think Sanjay, you mentioned uh, IIT Madras in one of your answers. So maybe we could start with you for this one. No, sure. I think for us, it's extremely important to 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 work uh, with, with uh, academia because uh, the, the kind, uh, I mean, the, the kind of innovation we are into, a lot is happening in the in the energy transition uh, in into these various IITs. And I will give one classic example of uh, of IIT Kanpur, of one of the startup working on on uh, uh, on a battery technology which is alternative to lithium ion, yeah, and and that's on uh, uh, zinc gel battery. We found that so interesting because zinc uh, is available in abundant and there. Are, there are many such advantages, you know, when we compare that with lithium ion, and and if this can really disrupt at scale in India, uh, this can really, you know, create an edge over over some of the restrictions which we have in in lithium ion, yeah. And uh, and it's a great team, and and we help them to bring their lab prototype to the commercial prototype, and then uh, we we further worked with them in building their commercial model over the last two years, and uh, um, and Shell. You know, venture arm invested in that company. There are other invested also invested in the company, um, and and they're today kind of also moving ahead further in scaling their product in India. And uh, within Shell, of course, we are also working with them to 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 work. Uh, you know how we can integrate their battery technology. Uh, you know, in within our you know uh, retail mobility business which we have in India. So I think that's one great example. I was there again in as I mentioned in uh, IIT Madras and. Uh, was was talking about various aspects of uh, I was into the chemical department, which is one of the best in the country in, in IIT Madras and uh, and and uh, and I was meeting all the PhD doctors student and and the professor. And I was so amazed to, to see the kind of work they were you know, doing in, in, in building the battery chemistry and technology. And, and then one thing uh, in terms of converting, you know, the renewables, which is we converted the entire, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, the entire battery from the solar, they, they captured the power from there and they're lighting their entire building with that. And, and we kind of now discussing that is one of the, you know, ch you know, challenges which we are facing is uh, in the EV is that how green is my EV is when the back end is still fossil, right? Uh, which is still a cold, right? And and then that's the, that's the area where we're working is that can, can an EV charger can go uh, off grid because again the grid is again we see it, uh, d does not have the capacity to take all the loads what a, what an EV will bring, right? And and of course there are various other policy match, you know things which is coming up. And now we we are also thinking can can we really bring the renewable energy into that space with them? And and we are working very closely to see how how it can really help us because at, so these are the various other things we we are working uh, as well. I think on the on the battery safety there is a lot of work going on in the battery safety. So they're working with quite a few OEMs and, and, and something we also wanted to, you know, engage with that when, when some of the batteries are getting exploded. Uh, so how, how we work with them in the battery safety from a, from a, um, you know, uh, from a thermal, uh, you know, um, you know, damage or from the electrical abuse and how it can be mitigated through the digital layer. I think those are the things which uh, we are working. So, yes, definitely we, we are working on that. Thanks, thanks, Sanjay. It's, you know, it's it's interesting the uh, you know the the level of sort of involvement that you have with uh, the academic institutions. Uh, Rajesh Navanita, you know, I think it'd be great to to hear from you. Uh, you know how you approach uh, academic partnerships. So Navanita, do you want to go first? Yeah. So um, we are closely working with 
uh, key academic institute of India, whether it is IIT, ISC Bangalore, or many other institute or some, some local colleges as well. Uh, we found that great ideas are there, people, students, young students, they are working on exciting projects. And uh, although uh, the, the, this, this engagement are uh, helpful in, in three ways. One is to source early stage startup. That is one key thing. Second is uh, this, the professor, the, our engagement with this professor, especially in the advanced material domain, coding domain. It helped us to evaluate the technologies that we are otherwise testing with other startups. Third layer of uh, engagement where we also utilize their uh, facilities or equipment to test the technology. In, in, in the, uh, the JV that I talked about, uh, where we have done a JV with a ceramic startup, ISC Bangalore and the professors of ISC Bangalore has helped us immensely to, to culminate the engagement from a mere POC level to a joint venture. So we do find merit in engaging with different academic institute, as I said, not only to source, but also give their expert comments, mentorship, and as well as utilizing their uh, resources, not only in terms of human resources, but the facilities that these ITs are having. See, I'll answer this in two parts, Gary, because previous digital Singapore had brought up. So we not only look at educational institutions and academic institutions in India, but also in Singapore. So, you know, we partner with uh, some of the leading institutions in Singapore, not only for talent, so we have internship programs, we convert them into permanent staff here in Singapore, but also we work with their investment arm, they have incubation investments going on. And we work closely with them to look at ideation and what could fit in. There's no point in redeveloping something that we are looking for. So we're working on some new age deep tech disruptive technologies and products that require a lot of uh, you know kind of r d work and uh, and kind of ideation creation with education institutions jointly in india also we work with the iits and the uh, nits etc and other leading institutions and not only again on internship and talent but also on ideology and uh, products so previous models has its own partners credit has its partners iit madras Sanjay mentioned that very popular for, for some really good uh, R&D and ideation work. So we also work very closely with them. But quite frankly, I think it's great to look at it, but you also need to understand that sometimes academic issues, particularly in Singapore, it takes a lot to get the process and time it takes to, to get the partnership going can be quite complex sometimes, Sanjay. So you need to think through exactly as to what you want to do, where you want to play, and how you want to go about it. And it's not, uh, you know, it, it, and, and this, there are a lot of people approaching them, but they are looking at it from an academic perspective. They're not looking to monetize it. Whereas you, as a partner, are looking to actually create something that benefits the world while monetizing. So sometimes you're working a little bit against each other in this whole process, and that's where you need to have some commonality and trust. Sure, I think that's an interesting point you've raised. You really sort of go in with a, a very clear objective of how you want this uh, partnership to work. And, you know, just following up on the question of partnerships, I know that Shell, uh, you know, has several partnerships with other corporates, including Tata Steel. Uh, so, you know, I was just wondering, Sanjay, if you could elaborate a little bit, uh, you know, on how Shell approaches uh, partnerships uh, of that nature. Uh, and then it would be great to hear from uh, Nabunita and Rajesh as well. Yeah, probably Navanita of, uh, can also share more about um, the partnership we had and uh, and uh, we know each other for the last uh, few years and we have been discussing on, on several aspects on it. Um, so I'll, I'll go back, you know, when and how we evolved actually, uh, Swati, is that when we started this, we only thought that um, we wanted to create value for Shell and, and that's the way we wanted to look into it. But then over the, over the period of time, we realized that Shell alone cannot make a startup scale or become big and and you need uh, your partners and and when you talk about creating value and when you're talking about you know you know driving clean energy in the clean energy space in the renewable space uh, you can you you can do not want to work alone number one you you cannot work alone number two because uh, it's, it's a space where you need to work collectively and 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 that's the way you can bring the best out of uh, the technology and the solution yeah and and we learned over the years when, uh, in the first two years and then we thought is uh, let's look around for for partners who have the very common vision the way we have uh, 
who's working on digital technology, who's working on carbon capture utilization, working with solar, working with, uh, you know, future of mobility in the battery tech, uh, working with uh, waste management in circular economy and how to turn, you know, plastic waste into, into fuels or into other energy forms. Uh, so when, when you do that, and then you look into, into the ecosystem, then you will see there are a lot of actually companies who are working in the various, these segments, a cement company, the automobile companies, you know, Tata Steel, and there's so many of them. And that's the time when we reached out to, to companies and we found that, uh, uh, everyone has been so positive about coming and joining us and working together because it's it's a common space uh, in terms of they are also looking for similar solutions and and uh, we are able to kind of uh, uh, you know work together in that space where you know they they were very interested to see our startups and and they have given POC uh, as well and then they have you know went ahead with it so um, and and there are so many companies I'm, I just named few uh, but uh, uh, we are currently working with some fourteen partners. Um, you know, in India and, and globally, because one of our startup also wants is that how I can take the solution outside India. Some of them are, you know, and there's some of their markets might be in US. So for me, it was very important to see that how I can really partner with a company who can really give them that market access in US. It can be an enterprise, it can be a system integrator, uh, it can be somebody else, you know, who can really help them to grow. And, and that's the way we look into from the ecosystem that do we have that, that partnership ecosystem who can provide that market access uh, to those organizations who are willing to grow. Yeah. And, and that's the way we work with our partners who, who have the common vision. Yeah. And probably Namunita can add more of all the conversations we have had in the past. Yeah. Support that you can provide to a high tier level startup is the number of um, number of corporates or the number of partners you are bringing onto the table. So we collaborated uh, with Shell uh, two years back, and one thing I must admit here that it was a great learning experience for us. That point of time, we are fairly new. We did not know the ecosystem well. We did not know how this this acceleration incubation and CVC works. We learned a lot from Shell Epo. Uh, we learned a lot from Shell Ventures. They provided provided us great support in terms of not only. Uh, um, understanding the ecosystem, but also they provided the database of the startup that they are working with. We also identified, though the areas are different, we are more focused into advanced material, but their focus areas are different, but we still could manage to find some overlapping areas where we could find some startup where we, we could do POCs together. Uh, second thing is, uh, which I would like to mention or highlight here that there will be always certain areas which are core to that particular uh, corporate, like for us, you know, advanced material or coating or process efficiency is something which is core to us. But however, there will always be certain areas like sustainability, um, uh, electrification. This is a, these are the area where corporate has to have come together. There should be consortium where people uh, come, the corporate can come together and provide a platform to the startup because all sustainability related projects are usually capex intensive project and. As they are early stage in nature, nature it is always easier to divide the cost and risk. So it is all. I always um, uh, uh, try to convince my senior leadership team and uh, getting experience from Shell. We are now collaborating with IOCL in this kind of startup engagement program and all. So um, this there is always a merit working with uh, partners. Though we are fairly new into this process, but we do definitely find merit in that and will uh, will um, aspire to do all this kind of engagement more rigorously in near future as well. Thank you, uh, Rajesh. So two three parts. One is, you know, when we did the investment program, the city of Stock, we saw a lot of startups that were really good, and about thirty or forty of these actually ended up in, uh, you know, kind of doing POCs and so on. So we could invest in all of them for a variety of reasons. But what we encouraged our businesses to do is, wherever there's business value in addition, in whatever area or form, ask them to work with them as partners. So these startups, even though we're not invested with them, they actually come into play, whether it's digital technologies, the ESG, or any area of value add to the businesses. Uh, another thing that we also did is for every one of the startups we invested in, we have uh, a sort of a valuation plan, we have partnership programs, where we pull them in to our solution stack when we go to market or provide them referral businesses into partnerships and new customers. 
that we have to deal with, which is why, you know, when we did the POCs, we did the POCs with, with a double objective. One is we feel comfortable that we're investing in a company that's got a credible product, which we could use. But also, if we can't use and we don't proof test the product, how can we go and market it externally? So that, that was one part of it. Now, the other thing is anything that is going to deliver sustainability in the long run, we're always open and keen to work with new partners as they emerge. And to the point that Sanjay made earlier, and Namodita also highlighted, you know, that's where we're not going to be too fussed about competition, because I think today the sustainability cannot be achieved by an individual. It has to come together as a group. And to do that, you need scale. And to drive that scale, you need economies of scale. You know, it, 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 some game has to be played, and that's where I think partnerships, alliances, and true transparency is going to be a huge differentiator and a change in the way we have been operating in the past. Thanks, Rajesh. The, a couple of audio. Sorry, Sanjay, did you want to add something? Yeah. Yeah. Can, I, can I add something here? Um, hello? Sure, go ahead. No, I, I kind of missed it because we are talking about CVC and, and we, I talked about more partnership in the market access perspective from a revenue perspective. But and, and I also see now, which I'm kind of working on and I wanted to throw this, this is very interesting, which um, uh, uh, I'm working now, is um, how we can really co-invest in a partnership model. I think that's that's coming out really, you know, and I'll tell you why. It's, I was talking to someone, um, you know, a, a, you know, senior fund manager, um, uh, of a multinational you know, VC, and he said that Sanjay, I understand fun, I understand investment thesis, but I don't understand energy. I don't understand what you do. Yeah, um, and when I look into it, that do I really understand, or or do corporate venture arm do really understand what it takes to make an investment thesis the way a venture capital would do, because that's their daily bread. That's the that's what they do. Uh, maybe we do understand, but not the way they do, because that's that's where they've been doing it, right? And that's where it came that can we really come together and, and create a vehicle, an SPV of an investment on a you know, and separate fund around that. And, and, and that's where we are discussing because what they're looking into it is that an energy company investing means that they're assuring market access and they're having a neck in the game and they will probably help that company to grow. And where we look into to the other aspect is that, it is that but we are not the only one who's been investing. There are others who are assessing and the VC is investing and they, they are very sound in investment thesis and, and they know how to, how to build it and to invest in the right company and they can help in the various deal flow and the, and the due diligence better than and, and the CVC can really do. And, and that makes a very collective effort when you talk about partnership in the investment space. And there can be multiple of them in creating in part of that SPV. And, I'm, I, and the way I'm looking forward is in future, uh, this is something that's going to gain traction. Uh, so there is a lot of traction in the revenue space, how the organization can really give access to business, but then how the organization can come together, mostly, you know, a mix of family office and a venture capital and a corporate venture arm coming together, creating a fund and then taking it forward. Yeah, because it, it kind of de-risk for one company to put all the money right up and because it's a collective fund and, and that's going to be something interesting going to come out uh, in the near future. Thanks, Sanjay. I mean, that's really sorry, Rajesh. Did you want to go? I just want to add. You know, uh, we did something very maverick, which we have never done before in the group, and this was around flipping a strategic investment to a financial investment. We did that recently, earlier in the year, where you know one of the investment companies that we have focused, we really focus on automotive. Uh, they came back with some interesting uh, solutions back around energy, water, future in agri tech, and so on. These are all long term, green, sustainable. Initiative. And we felt that, you know, if we were to hold them as a 100% subsidiary and do those things, they're not going to be able to follow the passion and heart and deliver something in the new economy. And we said, okay, let's give these guys the control back. And we took the structures, we worked through a transaction, listed transaction, and obviously they had disclosed that. But, you know, what we effectively did is create something new where we could take an automotive organization that was predominantly focused on that and allow them to focus on new things, energy. Water, agri tech, et cetera, et cetera, and allow the concepts of IO to actually permeate into something beyond automotive. 
Thanks, I think it's, you know, really interesting perspectives from all three of you about how these collaborations can work, you know, to, to really find synergies across sectors, uh, you know, across verticals. Uh, I think Sanjay, you brought up a very interesting point about, you know, how could, you know, corporates start looking at engaging with funds because, you know, I think the skill set is very different. Uh, one looks at things more from, you know, a technology or a domain uh, expertise kind of point of view, while other, you know, VCs would look at it from more investability or financial returns. So I think, I think it's great, you know, to see, um, you know, the kind of collaborations that are going on and also this, you know, thank you for sort of starting this, this dialogue about uh, a broader engagement. Um, there are a couple of audience questions that I wanted to uh, address because we already passed uh, five o'clock. I think the first is from, um, Sakshi and a company called Equip9. I think this is more to do, um, you know, she's interested in possibly, uh, you know, pitching to to the panelists. So I'll I'll leave that to you know for you to take uh, offline. Possibly Sakshi, if you're still on the call, you could share, uh, you know, a website or some kind of contact. So maybe the panelists could pick this up um, after after the event. Uh, one of the questions that was sent from our uh, audience uh, earlier was uh, they wanted to know a little bit more about um, agreements between uh, startups and uh, corporate venture capital arms uh, and specifically who takes the risk of uh, failure of product uh, development going wrong. So I think it could be, I mean, any, any of the panelists, I think would be qualified to, to answer that. You know, of course, I think rather than talk about failure, why don't we talk about success? You see, there is, it goes case to case, right? I mean, at the end of it, uh, Shwati and uh, who posed the question, I think, look at it positively and look at, uh, you know, two options. See, when you look at deep tech, you look at partnering and or strategic investment. Now, commercial terms vary deal by deal. There's no hard and fast rule, no cookie cutter approach for this. Risk and opportunity are typically shared in a partnering arrangement. But look at it from a CVC perspective or a strategic investor. If things don't work out, it's a question of writing off the money or it's just a pay pass and pass in the business. But to a founder or the startup founder, the employees, it just goes way beyond the business. It can truly be life changing. So when we address something like this, I believe CVC corporates would actually have an empathetic view and a humane view as you work through that. But again, you need to sit down and work through your terms, conditions, and products. There is nothing saying that only the, uh, uh, the, the corporate will take the risk and opportunities come to the startup. It has to be balanced, fair and square, but again, it comes transaction by transaction. I don't know whether I answered that, but to me, that seemed to be the first thing that talks. Thanks, Rajesh. Sanjay or Namanita, would you like to add anything? I, I find uh, the, uh, the question a little bit uh, ambiguous, actually. I mean, honestly, because uh, uh, so, so, so if you're invested in a company, I mean, if, if a CVC or anyone is invested in a company, your neck is in the game and you're equally involved uh, to see how the company grows. Of course, you would see people who are the front runners who are taking this organization forward. They are the ones who brought this idea in. But anything which fails right from product to commercialization, uh, commercialization I think uh, everyone is kind of to, you know, to be blamed in, in, in that way. Sometimes what happens is when you work with uh, large organizations uh, and, and they are the CVCs, they wanted to bring their ideas and thinking which can go absolutely against in line with what the, 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 you know, the young organization may have thought. So in, in a way you can say that, you know, the CVC are the one who kind of, you know, should be blamed for the failure. So, and, and there's vice versa, there's always like that, you know, but instead of pinpointing with each other, I think if you're in part of the game, if you're part of the board and in, in decision-making, I think uh, it's, it's a response, collective responsibility of everyone rather than putting into to, to one person that, you know, that person to be blamed. Thanks, thanks, Sanjay. Uh, and the last uh, question from the the participants is: uh, How do corporates encourage startups, specifically in deep tech, that may need sustained corporate collaboration before commercial value is is delivered? I think, in part, you know, this question has been answered previously. But if there's anything you'd like to add, uh, specifically on corporate, I mean, sorry, on startups working in in deep tech that uh, you're working with. 
I just like to add one thing, Swati, because I think it's important. I think Sanjay mentioned about accountability, right? I mean, look, everybody has skin in the game. It's how deep the skin is. As I said, CVC, it's a question of money. People write off, you lose a little bit of faith, credibility, but you move on. For uh, startup founders, it's their entire life. They spend seven years, eight years working, building. They put a lot of emotion uh, that goes into it. It can be heartbreaking for them at the end of it. What is important is that they have to be very clear objectivity in metrics and measurement. Success and failure uh, are very difficult to judge and gauge. I mean, you know, today technology is going at such a fast pace that some great ideas and ideation that comes in today will become obsolete very quickly if you don't get it to market quick fast enough. You know, if you spend too much time doing R and D and trying to create a perfect product, then you know what? Somebody else is going to overtake you with that disruptive idea, take it to market, and whatever form or shape, they're going to then fine tune that and continue to grow. You want to try and build a perfect product, and sometimes you got to balance between perfection and monetization because you need to move forward on that. Now, the question is uh, also clear, saying that you know commercial value may take time. So it depends on what you are building and what it is, because there are certain things that require a large amount of value. You can't take it to market quick enough. You can't monetize it quickly enough, and patience, sustenance. You so you need to find the right partner and the right investor to be able to. You know, have the wherewithal to hold you uh, 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 for, for that long a period of time. Thanks, thanks, Rajesh. Uh, as we're sort of, you know, coming towards the end of time, I just wanted to ask, uh, you know, two questions to to each of our, our panelists before we close. One is, you know, what advice would you give to uh, a startup looking to engage with, uh, you know, with corporate venture capital or with, you know, sort of a traditional or conventional um, business? And the second would be, you know, what advice would you give to uh, our CII member companies who are looking to set up uh, CVC arms of their own or, you know, start uh, in, in some small way, start engaging with uh, startups? So I'd love to hear, uh, you know, from each of you, um, your your thoughts on these two questions uh so uh, i can go first um uh, uh, swati sure go ahead. Audit? yeah so uh if i get your question right so the kind of advice uh, what i would like to give is uh, and which i normally do is um is that if you're working on something uh look for something which is uh scalable um uh, look look for something which you can drive with speed. Yeah. And third one is very importantly, which I tell them is that, you know, uh, have the ability to fail because uh, eventually uh, uh, you will fail somewhere or the other, if not in, in, in entirely. And you should be able to come up again and, and, and try what you love to do the, you know, with passion. I think this is what, what I normally, you know, tell, you know, every, every young, um, and entrepreneurs who are coming with an idea and, tell, and you know every now and then people come with an idea and tells me that Sanjay how about this how about that yeah and and I also say that um, you know and I kind of agree with what Warren Buffett uh, you know always says it is that you know play in the area where where your strengths are and and, and know your subject really well uh, so I think uh, this this is something is what I would like to say and and also you know the second part of the question like what advice would you give you know companies looking to engage with startup you know how do they uh, we mentioned in the beginning there was a lot of you know reluctance uh, what advice would you give them how do they start thinking about this um, you know because i think innovation and r and d through startups and it's it's going to be hard to ignore you know as we as we move into the future so what advice would you give them how do they start um, you know, making sort of steps in the right direction. I think, uh, the, and, and this I normally give to, to, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, you know, you know, who are women's I'm part of, uh, some women's entrepreneur network. Uh, why I say that is, and also in, you know, the startups who are from the tier two and tier three cities, where they are kind of making amazing, interesting ideas and, and, and product is that first of all, you need to be really bold and, and reach out upfront and what you want and, and, uh, you know, always we have seen that, uh, you know, sometimes it is your own in inhibitions which pulls you down. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, because the environment plays that role that not good enough and, you know, more po less positivity and more negativity, which may flow in your environment and which may pull you down. So have that bold mindset of reaching out to the co corporates. You know, it's a digital world, online world, 
and and understand how you can really network through people and and reach out to them and come out with your proposition this is what i have yeah how you can really can help me can you really mentor me in these aspects by only asking you you get you know what you want uh, and i think one has to be really bold in that thanks thanks sanjay uh, namunida if you'd like to go next you know your advice to to startups looking to deal with corporates and then similarly corporates uh, looking to deal yeah, with yeah. startups i would rather address the second question first because i have dealt with the second question in the last two years so one thing that uh, helped me to convince my senior leadership is that the opportunity we are losing if we are not investing or we if we don't have cc another thing that that we uh, that helped us a lot is a um, benchmarking study and a benchmarking study we should not pick up only the big names it should be across the sectors across the stage across the different kind of uh, engagement so benchmarking study the opportunity loss in, if you only engage with a startup in a vendor buyer mode and we treat them as only vendor so these are the first step that we need to address before before we go to our any senior leadership team because as i said there is an innovation in in terms of um uh, in terms of venturing into this kind of uh, uncertainty and venturing into cvc model a uh, second which helped us that working on certain life cases which helped us even so we took certain life cases we we did we actually have gone the entire um, process of um, uh, picking up a startup and doing investment although we chose only one to invest but we have gone through the entire process and we have seen that how much time effort energy senior leadership time is needed to do this to take this decision once that is done and people are actually hands on to do this kind of uh, ex exercises they are more confident to do that because in tata steel and is it true for all other corporate also we are not equipped or we don't have the required skill set so once you have gone through the path once you know the challenges once you know the partners to with whom you can deal these challenges then you are more confident so um, benchmarking Uh, uh and uh, uh, addressing the or valuing the uh, opportunity and the most important thing working on some line cases will definitely help a corporate to work on the cvc second part is the uh, the, uh, the um, uh, advice that i give to startup whenever a startup is working with a corporate see, uh, startups are working at different pace and corporates are working at different pace so the in, usually the decision making process in any corporate i am not uh, saying xyz in any corporate it has its own cycle time and it has its own expectation from the startup there is a mismatch both in terms of expectation and both in, in terms of the cycle time of any process whether it is vendor registration or vendor onboarding or any feedback cycle time so i always advise a startup at the very early stage while engaging with the corporate you have to be little bit patient and <laughs> on the contrary i also advise my own people that you have to be little bit agile it's a it's coming to the same platform for both the parties because i am standing on the interface i know the challenge of internal people i know the challenge from the outside startup ecosystem how we can actually marry those these two ecosystem that is the biggest challenge that this this entire thing is facing now so the more agile we are as a corporate and the more patient we are as a startup is the only advice that i could provide thank you thank you thank you so much uh, navanita rajesh Starting, you know, I will go in sequence, right? So the advice I would give startups looking to engage with our company, or this strategic company in general, is that look, follow your heart, and I will convey rightly mentioned, believe in yourself, fail safe. And uh, Navita point, patience and perseverance is very critical because you know we get approached for business and funding by numerous startups. As we all know, you know, the um, first impression counts, right? You make the impact, the first opportunity that you get. use it very well to convince us or any corporate with a compelling story around your product and platform the value add it brings to the business and the industries that it serves along with their growth goal both past and future it is very critical to highlight the market relevance of your product and its platform or the platform the scalability 
the presentation and competitive advantage you would bring business model because there are so many startups everybody claims the same thing so how are you different from somebody else right then your monetization aspect and your go-to-market specific particularly when it comes down to investments if you're asking for funding then these things become very very important in your go-to-market you're looking at the approach clients and partners very important to also share adequate specifics to accord comfort and confidence to the investors around your value creation and growth story particularly around specifics and how you plan to deliver your companies you know we see a lot of people coming and say i'm five thousand dollars today in revenue in two years time i'll be two million dollars okay fantastic but tell us how are you going to get there what is it that you're going to do what is your plan where is your pipeline what is your conversion ratio and how are you going to go and reach that scale and is your product so disruptive that people are going to come and uh, you know kind of uh, stick with you in the long run because you know in SaaS models ARR is important and subscription is important long term uh, you know kind of stickiness is very important coming to your second question what advice would I give to CIA members look I'm not a super expert but my learning uh, with all humility tell me that look PVC is definitely worth exploring but in a very structured and objective manner it should be run as a program with a lot of accountability and ownership at the outset, please be very clear on your strategy and objective, including A, how much dollars you want to invest, B, number of startups you want to invest, what are the areas you want to play in, and whether you want to be a financial investor or a strategic investor. Now, this is very important because the approach, selection, and evaluation criteria is very different for the two of for, for these two. Now, you also create a small team of experienced professionals, whether it's internal, external, doesn't matter, but they must have domain expertise and MA expertise. Now, with the playbook around where to play and how to win, build out your deal flow. Define success objectively. Firm up your risk appetite threshold, particularly since you're a corporate VC. You need to have that with your stakeholders and create very strong program management team. Okay, institutionalize that. Next, you finalize the selection and evaluation criteria upfront. You give some flexibility, but because as you work through the journey, you'll find some puts and takes, some compromises. Or benefits that you may need to work through but also be very clear on your ticket size really, how much dollars is the maximum you will invest what kind of shareholding thresholds do you expect for that what are the pre-money valuation caps you want to work through and since your strategy what are the critical rights that you may mandatorily require and whether you want to be majority with control of the startup or you want to be in majority in my life. now if you're a financial investor some of these things don't matter now if you're a strategic investor please do a POC to prove test the sum. And after investment, work jointly with the founders to develop an operationalized and VCP or a value creation plan to help them realize their vision and mission. Last but not the least, my request and suggestion is, ensure you create an environment of mutual respect and trust with the startup founders and their current investors as you work through the problem. There's no one up country. We may be the biggest corporate in the world, but we have to respect what they do because they do something that we can't do that innovation that creativity that ideation and entrepreneurship is something that large corporates cannot do which is why we go to the startup ecosystem and start partnering them and last but not the least another additional command i would like to make is sometimes uh, you know you may start off being a strategic investor but don't be afraid to tip to a financial investor if the need arises because sometimes circumstances and situations may warrant that Thank you so much, Rajesh. You know, a lot of great points that you've raised and, you know, essentially given uh, our members a sort of, uh, you know, playbook on how to how to start thinking about this. And, uh, you know, thank you to to all of our panelists, Sanjay, Nabunita and Rajesh, you know, for taking the time out and being very candid and frank with all of your insights. Uh, like I mentioned at the beginning of the program, this is really to start, uh, you know, a dialogue um, within uh, the, you know, the, the sort of corporate community of how we engage with startups and similarly for startups, you know, to get a little bit of insight into how CVC uh, arms uh, of large companies think. So I'd really like to to thank you all for for not just taking the time out, but really being, you know, very generous with your, uh, you know, with your comments, with your answers, you know, and with your feedback. Um, and I'm sure it's been a great uh, learning experience for all of our members as well as the other, um, you know, audience uh, participants today as well. So thank you all, uh, and we look forward, you know, through CII to, you know, continuing this this dialogue. Uh, Ninaz, would you like to, to add anything? Only two words. Thank you.
Thank you, Swati, for your efforts. Thank you, panelists, for sharing your thoughts. Uh, this is the beginning. Hopefully, in a year or two, if not lesser, we should say that in India, we see uh, out of the VC funds, uh, at least 20, 25% is coming from CVC. This is the beginning. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Sanjay, Navarita. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much.